Hallelujah. Wow, God is good. Amen, amen, amen. All right. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, let's do that. I think, I think it's actually almost already where it needs to be. Uh, just a little bit more and that should be perfect. Thank you so much. How is everybody doing today? Okay, all righty. Yeah, come on, come on. That's good. Even if you're not sounding excited, um, it's okay too. You know, because I've got a word for people that aren't overly excited in this season. You know, because you know, you go through certain seasons and you're just not feeling it. You understand what I mean? And um, one of the things that I like to do ahead of the meeting is for God to take me into the meeting, show me what he is doing. You see, like Jesus said in all of his ministry, you know, Jesus never really did what the people wanted. You see, in fact, the Bible says the moment he knows what, he, what they want, then that becomes an issue. Then he makes sure that he does the opposite. You understand what I mean? He, he knows in their heart that they wanted to make him king because of free sandwiches that he was giving out. He decided to do the other, to go the other way. Rather than pandering to whatever they wanted, he actually shut down their clamoring because, again, none of us here truly benefit from God doing the things that please us. Let me say that again. Don't get it twisted. The Bible says the Lord grants the desires of our hearts. But the Lord is not in the business of doing your pleasure. Because if God does what pleases us, we will not like where our lives will end. Simply because we were not made for our own pleasure, we were made for his pleasure. You understand what I mean? And so that is the reason why it is important for us to know that when God is setting out, he sets out to do his will. And what is the will of God? That our lives come to a place of pleasing him. And so, I want to know what's in the heart of God. Jesus says, the things that I do are the things that I see my Father do. The words that I say are the ones that I hear Him say. And so, as I was listening and looking to see what the Lord has for us today, one of the things that the Lord made abundantly clear to me was that many of us in the body of Christ are currently not excited about the things that we have become accustomed to as required for growth in our walk with God. Somebody reached out to me very, very recently. And so when the Lord showed me that, I was not surprised because somebody had reached out to me earlier to say that there are activities and exercises of faith that he would engage in that will bring fun and excitement, but in recent times, they have not been delivering the same excitement. Fasting is not delivering the excitement. Even studying the Word of God is not delivering the excitement. And so, if you are in that season, wherein the things that you have come to know from time immemorial as being those exercises that you engage in to help your spiritual growth and development, things that you have come to associate with being spiritual, if those things are no longer has, I mean, they're no longer being as fun, then I want you to congratulate yourself because God is doing you a big favor. All righty? He's doing you a big favor. I say that because I have been in that situation before. Multiple times I've been in that situation wherein studying the Bible was no longer exciting, exciting to me. Praying was something that I just did because I'm like, man, I've always done it. Now I'm going to have to keep doing it. And on some days I didn't even do it because I'm like, what is even the point? And those times the initial thought was that God had left me. The initial thought, if I one day I prayed to God and I said, if you don't want me, just tell me. I feel like I'm forcing myself on you. I'm spending hours praying and I do not feel the excitement. Have you withdrawn from me the joy of your salvation? And then I went through that season and it was like a wilderness experience. I tell you one thing for sure. Guys, there is nobody that ever becomes God's friend without first of all going through the wilderness. If God is going to call you or God has his call upon you, he first of all makes sure 
that you go through a wilderness experience of sort wherein there is no excitement wherein there is no fruit there is nothing you're just existing and you're full of questions and I say that because I can say that authoritatively because that is what the word of God says Abraham had to leave the, the lusciousness of being a general and a prince he had to leave all of that behind because when you look at history, Abraham was the same person in the Sumerian history that was responsible for putting at bay a particular legion of giants. The same Abraham, while he was still in his father's house, he was a big boy, he was a prince with authority and a military might, but the Lord said for him to leave all of that behind and go to a land that it would show him and he had to travel, travel through his own wilderness experience. Lot chose to settle in Sodom and Gomorrah. Why? Because Lot was tired of being in the wilderness for decades, for year in, year out. Nothing but wilderness. And so the moment he had an opportunity to choose a land that was somewhat luscious, what did he say? He said to Abraham, he was like, with all due respect, sir, I ain't doing this wilderness no more. I am going to those people. They can be as bad as hell, but I want me some relief. And you saw what that, what that cost him. Do you think Lot's wife looked back for no reason? Look at their history. They've been traveling through wildernesses. They've, they've had famines and droughts. Abraham had had to lie his way out just because things were tough. And then they, had, they were living in Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible says from a distance you could tell how rich of an oasis Sodom, the regions of Sodom were. And so when the lady was asked to leave, she struggled. Do you know that even Lot was literally dragged out? And that is because of the fact that they just couldn't go back to where they were coming from. Another wilderness? Spear me. Moses was raised in the palace of Pharaoh. He had plenty. He had all of that royal treatment. And yet, God couldn't use him in that state because he hadn't fulfilled the requirement. Jesus, who was the word of God that became flesh to dwell amongst men, could not even begin his ministry until the Father had sent him into the wilderness. The Bible says that after God spoke over Jesus, saying, this is my beloved son and I'm well pleased, then he sent him into the wilderness. Do you know the reason why you're feeling that spiritual drought is because God is pleased with you? You know, quite often we think that when God is pleased with us, he will ask the angels to come and sing us a song because God knows that if he celebrates you before your time, he, that is synonymous to destroying you. Let me tell you something. God does not like premature celebration because if that was me baptized by John with the heavens, in fact, I, I wouldn't have to do anything. If the heavens had opened above me, and the, 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 the Holy Spirit had descended upon me like a dove. Between my mother and my wife, they would have thrown a party. My mom would send an invitation to all of her friends. <laughs> my son is pleasing to God, party. <laughs> my wife will make jollof rice of like four different flavors. And there's no way I will be able to escape it because they will make sure that I attend the party? You see what I mean? Most of us, if we had received such a commendation of God, what do we do? Do you know the reason why the wilderness experience is sometimes the most painful? It's because it usually follows a time of you enjoying your fellowship with God and feeling like you are God's friend. And that is when the Holy Spirit hits you with a wilderness experience and you're like, okay, God, two weeks ago, we were still cool. What happened between now and then? Did I say something? Did I hurt your feelings? The first time that happened to me, for real, for real, I woke up one Sunday morning. I woke up from a bad dream. But the bad dream was not bad enough. I had to, I had to experience a troubling trance wherein I laid in the living room and a man walked into the room. Someone that looked like those Bible characters that you would see in children's storybooks. He was bald-headed and he wore like a brown tunic and a brown cloak and he had a sash around his waist. What is it this time? Okay, because someone is calling me, are you trying to call my attention? You know, because I'm that guy, sometimes I would come up here without my fly done, without my buttons right. So if someone is calling my attention, I am mindful of it. 
you know I can remember once before I was invited to go speak somewhere and I had done my button the other way around because my wife wasn't there nobody to tell me so when I got on stage I had skipped two buttons and my shirt looked like I had just been run over by a bicycle and so when I came up and people saw that people started laughing I was like my goodness I hadn't even said anything I thought I had jokes but I didn't know that I was the joke Praise the Lord. So I'm going to put this phone on, don't disturb, so that that way no salesman gets a hold of me. Um, but let me, what was I saying again? I was in that living room and this man walked into the room and then he started to ask me a series of questions. He stood in front of me like I am standing in front of you, but I knew he wasn't there in the physical. I knew I was in the trance. He was still that living room. He walked in and he started asking me a series of questions. And by the time he walked out of the room, he was like it literally, it was like it literally took my faith with him. For like two months after that, I couldn't read the Bible. I, I could hardly pray. I started asking God questions like what happened? Why or how did heaven let such a torment come my way? After like two months, I forced myself to start reading the Bible again. But whether it was Greek or Hebrew, I could not tell. Nothing was making sense to me. And all I heard from the Holy Spirit was keep reading. And I, after a while, I was like, I can't do this. It took a while, it took another season and a half for me to begin to recognize that God was actually showing me that he was pleased with me. Because if God is pleased with you, then he does you the favor of introducing to your heart the value system of heaven. Because as human beings, we do not know, but God knows how flimsy we can be. The Bible says that the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? Do you know that what God was doing was he had recognized that I didn't know the difference between what I was seeking and how I was seeking it. Do you know that your heart could easily be in love with studying the Bible more than the one you are studying about? Do you know that it is possible for you to be addicted to the joy and the feeling of praying consistently that you actually begin to escalate your love for the exercise above the one you are praying to? Let me tell you something. There was a time I couldn't have tea or coffee without putting a ton of sugar in it. Many, many years ago. And then after a while, I went cold turkey. Zero sugar for years. And that is the reason why now I can have coffee or tea with or without sugar. There's this Chinese green tea that I like to drink. Even the smell of it drives my wife upstairs. She tells me it smells really bitter. And I'm like, it tastes even more bitter. Aren't you going to put some honey in it? No. Sugar in it? No. Simply because the Lord had allowed for me to elevate myself above the pleasure of sugar. So sugar has no hold on me. Because as human beings, we by default become addicted to the things that please us. When you find pleasure in a thing, you become addicted to it. Do you know how many of us are friends with sons of Satan? Simply because those sons of Satan, we have become addicted to the pleasure that they bring and God is telling you they will destroy you, but you're telling God, don't worry, I got this. You think you got it, but you ain't got nothing? Let me tell you something. When God recognizes that you are his beloved son in whom he takes pleasure. He will protect that pleasure by not letting you be married to anything but your desire for the kingdom. What I didn't know was at the time because of the revelations that I was drawing from the word of God and because of how I felt, I felt so powerful after I have prayed for 12 hours, 15 hours, I will feel invincible. I, used, I, I told my wife a while ago, I said it was a season in my life that after having prayed for hours, I would beg the Lord for my feet to touch the ground because I would not feel like I am walking. And God was like, this one is getting intoxicated. He's getting addicted to this exercise. To the point wherein I was longing for the next revelation. I was longing for the next spiritual high, but I wasn't longing for the most high. 
the danger of getting accustomed to the things that give us pleasure is that if we are not careful, even the so-called godly things can become things that please us instead of us pleasing him. Imagine if you were a Levite in the time of Aaron and all the people would bring the animals and they brought the best of the animals. You know that you could easily get accustomed to or addicted to the pleasure of eating the meat of sacrifice and forget the reason why those animals have to die. When Jesus was presented to the world as God's beloved son in whom, was, in whom God was well pleased, he had to be sent into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil because God wanted for there to be nothing in him but the hunger and the thirst for the righteousness of God's kingdom. So I want to encourage you, if you are in that season, wherein studying the Bible now does not excite you as much anymore, praying does not excite you as much anymore, congratulations, because for you to continue doing it is to discover that beyond the scripture is the one who is the author of life himself. Let me tell you something. You have to get to that place wherein you die to self and die to every one of those pleasures. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that bodily exercises profit little, but godliness is profitable. Godliness is that state that you attain unto wherein nothing else satisfies but the Almighty Himself. I'm telling you this, folks. There should never be an incentive. If I was to summarize the, the principle or the mystery or the secret behind climbing the mountain of God, if I was to summarize it in one statement, that statement will be the death of incentives. If you would seek God and find Him, if you would climb the mountain of God without relenting, then you must see to the death of all incentives in your life. If you come to church because you feel good about the people at church, then that is your incentive for coming, not because your heart is genuinely obeying the word of God. I'm going to say that again slowly. Let me tell you something. Many of us, we set out because God says, do not forsake the gathering together of the saints. But then after a while, because of the pleasure of the hugs that you receive of all the people that you see and how they welcome you and how they receive you, time and time again, before you know what's going on, your first love is relegated to the back seat. And now you begin to come because of the experience that you have. You are seeking your own pleasure. It is a very sneaky thing, but many of us fall for it every now and again. And that is the reason why God would allow for the people that make you feel so good at church to take offense and leave so that if they're not there, God is watching, will you still come? Because God knows the heart. And he knows it's like, well, come the day comes because of the girl of rice. What would happen if one day the rice was salty? Will you still come? Well done, Brother Matthew. That would sell a tape. <laughs> but the idea, see, can I, let me, let me come from this particular perspective. I'm going to borrow one of the scriptures that my wife read to us. It's one of my favorite scriptures. I, I, I like it because it helps to humble the man, the human heart. Jeremiah chapter 10. We already just now, 1023, when my wife was reading to us about this, the real reason why man was made. Do you know that you and I, no matter how good looking we are, no matter how intelligent and how brave we are, we are really just an avatar? You know, I've preached that message before. Some people stopped coming after that because they felt like they were more than an avatar. And right now I see them, they're even less than an avatar. I would rather be an avatar than be nothing. Because the more full of yourself you are, the more empty you are because you without God is nothing. So if you are full of 100% nothing, it is still nothing. That was why David says, I will, David was the king of the foremost nation in the world. And you know what he said? He says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to be the champion of fools. I would rather. <laughs> Solomon said, do not hurry from the presence of the king. Why do you want to stand in an evil place? 
Because the moment you leave the presence of God, the Bible says in His presence there is fullness of joy. There is no real joy outside of the presence of God. There is deception. There is a good feeling out there, but nothing that is true joy exists, all of it. The Bible says all the real pleasure in the world is in His presence. And so whatever is pleasing you outside of His presence is nothing but an illusion. The Bible calls the deception of sin or the deceitfulness of sin. Jeremiah chapter 10 verse 23. Let's go, let's go, let's go because today we're still, we're already we're talking about how to climb the mountain of God. Jeremiah 10 23, what does it say? It says, behold, is it the one that you read? Was it Jeremiah 10 23 that you read to us just now? It says, behold, Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. Because I was looking at mine and he was saying something else, but apparently 22 can look like 23. Oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. The Bible says man was not made. You just read it to direct his own steps. In this life, as long as you are a human being, it is either you are led by the Holy Spirit or you are led by sin. Let me prove that to you real quick. When God was making man, what did he say he was making? He says, let us make man in our own image, after our own likeness. What do you call an avatar? An avatar is another image of yourself that you express with intentionality and for a purpose. He was intentional about it. Let us make man after our own image and let him have dominion over all that we have made. So essentially we are appointing him to represent us in this dimension while we observe from above. Your avatar is not supposed to do something other than what you authorize or what you would do. Imagine if I have an avatar that laughs like Manolita, then you'll be confused. Who are you looking at? Moses or Manolita? You understand what I mean? And God did such a wonderful thing by subjecting man to only one test after he created him. And the test was to see if man was in sync with God as a true avatar. And what was that test? God did not test to see how high man can jump. He did not test to see if man can build a skyscraper. In fact, he did not test man to see if he can solve math equations. There was only one test. The Bible says God brought all the animals that he had made. He brought them to man to see what he would call them. And the Bible says whatsoever man called them was their name. The Bible did not say whatsoever he called them became their name. No, the Bible says whatsoever man called them. So when God brought the dog to man and man says, mm, mm. you know what we do when we are receiving revelations? <laughs> mm. The man was like, mm. this is a dog. And God was like, I told you. You see, the reason why it was exciting to God was because man was not there when God made the dog. And God doesn't make things before he guesses what he would call them. Everything God makes, God makes by calling forth its name. So God already says, let the earth bring forth the dog. You understand what I mean? And so God already named it the dog. And that was why the Bible says whatsoever man called it was his name. There was already a name. And that was the only test God subjected man to. And God was like saying to the Elohim, you can see we have done a good job. Because he is not just in our image and in our likeness. He is functioning as we would function. Man did not have to think and assess a situation based on whether it is good or evil, he just did what was in the mind of God because it was an extension of God. Do you know the reason why Adam did not have to have eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is because the knowledge of good and evil is a weight system, a system for decision making. That's what the knowledge of good and evil is. But man did not require that because he didn't have to make decisions. He was led by the spirit. Let me tell you something. 
while he was that, what was he called? Adam was called the son of God. Come on guys, you know the genealogy of Jesus Christ. If you studied the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Jesus was the son of Joseph, the son of this, the son of that. And then they went all the way to the son of David and all the way to the son of Noah and all the way to the son of Abraham. And by the time they got to Adam or Seth, they said Seth was the son of Adam and Adam was the son of God. What makes you the son of God? As many as are led by the spirit, they are the sons of God. So to be the son of God is to be led by the spirit because it's either you're led by the spirit or you're led by the knowledge of good and evil also known as sin. And that was the reason why the moment man ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, the Bible says God had already warned them that in the day that you eat of that fruit, you shall die simply because your life is meant to be connected to mine and I am life. So if you are disconnected from me, you're disconnected from life. Your battery will run out one day because you're no longer connected to the source. And that was the reason why after 900 and something years, Adam's battery ran out. Ran out. Let me tell you something, folks. There are no two ways to it. It's either you're led by the spirit or you're led by your flesh. The Bible says the spirit was against the flesh and the flesh was against the spirit so that your soul is caught in the middle not knowing what to do. This one says fast. This one says eat. <laughs> I like the sound of eating. I'm going this way. But then I like to have power so I'm coming this way. And that's why the Bible says you are caught in between because Adam introduced a third entity. <laughs> the unholy trinity. But I want to say these folks, the significance of recognizing that our hearts are protected by God is that we begin to partner with God in protecting that heart. You see, the moment God is pleased with you, he comes in and makes sure that you are no longer self-seeking, you are no longer pleasure-seeking, that everything about you that can lead you away from him is stripped away from you so that all your being can be consumed with a passion for nothing but his glory. And the way God strips us of things is by taking us through a wilderness experience. I want to say this again because I know that there are people here. You know that there was a time that you enjoyed reading the Bible more than you do now. You know that there was a time you enjoyed praying more than you do now. And then you're wondering what has really happened. God is saying, I don't want the prayer and the exercise of praying and studying the word to be the end goal. It is a means to an end and I am that end. He says, I'm the beginning and I am the end. So be encouraged if you are in that situation. I'm not talking about people who have allowed their hearts to follow the lust of the world and the pleasures of this world. Who is not, I'm not talking about the person that is not even making time to fast or study the word of God. I'm talking about the people who are making the sacrifice and the conscious effort, but they're not finding the pleasure in it. Keep at it to the point wherein it doesn't matter anymore whether you enjoy it or not you will just have the fulfillment of knowing you have done the will of your father. Jesus said after a while, he says, men eat meat because it is pleasurable. He says, but my meat is to do the will of my father. God wants you to get to the point wherein nothing excites you, nothing moves you but the word of God. So like, like I said earlier on, the summary is seeing that every incentive dies. If I'm only studying the Bible because I get revelation with which I can go and oppress my friends and tell them, do you know? Then I have my reward. Because that becomes my incentive. But let me tell you something. If you live an incentivized Christianity, you will end in a place of emptiness. And I'm going to tell you why. Let me prove this to you for one second. Do you know that if I come to church to teach and every time I come down, John hands me a check of $5,000. I says that was some good preaching. Especially if I finish on time. So days that I go over time, maybe he gives me $4,500. It's not bad. I'll take it. Then 
if even though at the beginning I came out here because I'm passionate about sharing the principles of the kingdom and the mysteries of the kingdom, do you know that after a while my heart may choose that reward, as an, that money as an incentive over the passion for sharing what the Lord has given to me? It is human nature. Let's not, we're not angels here. These are people. Okay? This is what we do. Well, except for my wife. As soon as I said we're not angels, she looked at me because, you know, sometimes I say you're my angel. She's like, you're confusing me now. No, we're not angels, but she is. Because I'm going home with her tonight, so let's, let's play this thing safe. You see what I mean? But because we are human beings, the heart of man after a while, will go after things instead of God. Look at the children of Israel. They felt the blast that came from God's nostrils as it parted the Red Sea. No one had ever worked such a miracle and they knew that God was with them. The God that protected their firstborn children from the angel of death and gave them a, 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 a financial break overnight by turning all the wealth of the Egyptian to them. They knew that this God is a good God. They had held several intercessory crusades to be free from the land of bondage and they got an update through the prophet of God that God has heard them. When he sent them Moses, these were not people that were alien to the things of God. They had seen that God had become pleased with them because he says, now the cry of my people Israel have come to me and I will deliver them as I promised my friend Abraham. So they knew that they were in pleasure with God. But guess what? The moment they had things for longer that some of them can remember, they forgot God. Remember that they were all born into slavery. They were born into poverty. They had nothing to their name. Just like most of us in this generation. Do you know that most of us that are alive today, we have nothing to our name? And I'll prove it to you in case you think you have stuff. You have nothing. Because some people say, well, I don't owe anybody. I don't owe the bank. My house is fully paid for. Stop paying your property taxes. And then you see who really owns your house. Do you know that there is a power that allows for you to sell what you have and it's still yours? I've taught you about that power before. It is a power that exists. Look at Acts chapter 5. When Ananias and Sapphira sold their property, what did Peter say to them? He says, while it was yet to be sold, it was yours. And after you sold it, was it still not yours? There is a power for you. There is a power that allows you to sell. So the, the owners of this land, they sell you a land. You buy it, you pay for it, but it is still theirs. I know you don't like to hear that. You see that car that you're driving? Even after you have paid for it, it is still not your own. Because if you don't pay the government and you don't pay the insurance company, you can't drive that car. And if anything breaks in that car, you can't fix it. You have to take it back to Toyota. Because even though they have sold it to you, it is still theirs. Why don't you remove the Toyota and put my Nalita there and see how that will look? You see what I mean? And so, let me tell you this. These people are not different from us. It's just that we are so drunk with the Kool-Aid that we think that we are what we are not. The reason why many of us aren't looking forward to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is because we don't even know how bad things are. Because of the garlic and the honey. I mean, because of the garlic and the onions. Yeah, we take the garlic and the onions and we're like, oh my God, Egypt is awesome. Egypt is prison. We need the Messiah. We need our King's man redeemer. We are saved, thank God, but we need to be redeemed because there's no point paying for your new pair of shoes and leaving it at the store. You cannot be a lay away forever. That's what we are. We are currently a lay away. Jesus paid for us by his blood, but we are still here. And he told us, he said, until I come to redeem you, they will shove you aside. They will put dust in you. They will even try to resell you. Even on some days, you will list yourself for sale because you're bored and stupid. Because that's what we do sometimes. We sell our very Christian selves. Paid for by the blood of the Lamb. You sell yourself to worry. 
How can you let worry have your attention? How can you let doubt have your heart? The same heart that Jesus paid for, you even let sadness take it for a ride to town. He said, my people Israel, they have sold themselves into prostitution. Some of you, you let sadness take a whole three days of your life. You're like, oh, I've been so moody for like three days. I've just been sad. And that is because you sold, you rented yourself out to an evil spirit. The same one for whom Christ died. Why are you playing in the harlot? When the Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, if you are not joyful all the time, then you are selling yourself for that period for short. For cheap. Many of us, we contract our very virtues out to mammon. You work in a place where you know that what they're doing is evil. You walk with people that you know by the discernment of God that is in your heart that they are sons of Satan. But because every two weeks they give you that check, you want to die there, you are a prostitute. Let me tell you something. Jesus told us what we need to do is we cannot serve God and mammon. If I am not adding value and if I am not being celebrated for adding value, for crying out loud, I am God's son. If you don't recognize that, I'm moving. The Bible says when the son sets free, he's free indeed. The only person that can enslave you after Jesus has freed you is you. Because if you recognize that he has set you free, let me tell you something. Do you know the one that even annoys me the most? Many of us, we allow ourselves to be slaved to unforgiveness. There are places you want to go to, but because somebody is there that you do not like, you don't go. Do you know basically what you're doing is you pay for yourself to be in prison. The same you that Jesus died to set free. And that's why the Bible says, heaven can't help you anymore. The Bible says, if you like living sin, there is no more sacrifice for sin other than the one that has been made, which is the blood of the lamb. So if you like continue enslaving yourself to sin, Paul said it this way. He says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? That I haven't been set free by grace. Are we now going to contract ourselves to sin? He said, because it is the one that you give yourself and your members to obey that you serve. So if I'm always obeying my, my pleasure, my belly, Guess what? I am serving the cares of this world. If I only study the word of God when it feels good, then I am serving the flesh. If I only come to church because I like the people and the music, then I am serving my own pleasures. Because it is whom you obey that you serve. I want to tell you this, folks. These children of Israel, they already saw God. They have, they have seen the power of God. But because for so long they have had nothing. When God now gave them gold and silver. And gave them the freedom. Wherein they would wake up and nobody told them what to do. They lost their minds. They started to worship the gold and the silver. And God does not want you to be like them. And that is the reason why the moment he sees that you cannot handle what he has given to you. He takes it from you. Because he loves you. You know what, they, what Job said? He said, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because you know why? Job was now beginning to worship the things that God gave to him. Do you know Satan did not know that, but God knew? The Bible says that God had blessed Job so much. By man's standard, he was the richest man in the East. But he had sleepless nights. The Bible says that Job would pray and fast that his children would not sin against God in their hearts. That was how he lived his life every day, afraid that he would lose his blessings. And that was why when the blessings were taken from him, he was like, this is good for me, you know. He said, because this is what I fear and it has now come upon me. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You should fear losing nothing but God. I used to be afraid to lose certain people because their presence in my life gave me some kind of pleasure. And the Lord noticed that. He saw my heart. He looked again and was like, okay, we'll fix that. We will fix that. And some of them walked away from my life and did not even remember to text me. Until after a while, I'm like, I haven't seen this person in like a while. And I'm like, hello. They've blocked me. Oh my God. 
can you see them? Are they still alive? And they're like, yeah, they were here just the other day laughing like a, jack like a jackal. I'm like, but they're not responding to my messages. And I'm like, well, maybe they've blocked you. And that was when I started to realize that, wait a minute. Why am I feeling this bad? I should not feel this bad because somebody walked away. Did they take a part of me with them? Yes. And that's because I allowed it. And so I started to kind of like trace my steps back to God. And I'm like, God, you see what's going on? And he was like, yeah, I, I, I see it. Yeah. And I'm like, what are we going to do? He said, what we're going to do is you're going to heal from it and not let it happen again. <laughs> so that's why now, I don't care. You can walk away. As long as I look and God is still there, I'm like, right on King Jesus. No one's going to hinder you. You see, let me tell you something. As long as there is something that you hold more dearly than God. You know what God told me about people? He says, Moses, I want you to love people dearly, but hold them loosely. Some of us will love people loosely, but we hold them dearly. And that is the reason why when they leave us, they rip us apart because we're so glued to them. The arm of flesh shall fail. The Bible says riches will develop wings and fly away. You can't even put your trust in money. Because one day fiat, as we know it, will go away. Which is money, what we call currency. You see, because the Bible already prophesied. Fiat is going away, not because of the elites, not because of the failure or the greed of the central bank. It is going away because God said it. Political systems will crumble, not because of bad people, but because of a good God who has already prophesied or delivered to us through his prophets. Now, these things will go away so that our hearts will learn to trust in the captain of our salvation. If we lived in a system that is able to meet all of our needs perfectly, we would deny God and we'll be justified to do so. Let me tell you something, folks. We have come to a time wherein God is aggressively testing each and every one of us. You know that in the year 2020, I was minding my business and the Holy Spirit took me to the book of Zechariah and he showed me the prophecy about Jesus in Zechariah. I was excited about the prophecy of Jesus, even though a part of it was a little scary because the Bible says concerning him that he will come to the house of his friend and his friend will arrange for him to be crucified. I'm like, well, thank you, Jesus. That's already happened. What else do we have? And then the Bible says the people that are named by my name, after sifting them from the crowd, I will call them to myself. Only a third of the people, which is like, wow, really? What's going to happen to the rest two thirds? And then after that, he said, and the ones who are the remnants of my people, I will cause them to pass through the fire and watch over the furnace to see the ones that will come out for they shall be as gold. You know, you can read that, but when the Lord shows you the process, I didn't know whether to cry or whether to just tell him to take me in that very moment. The people who were there at the time when I taught around that subject, they, know, they knew there was, a, there was a, an intensity in my voice as I said it because I know that for God, it is not just enough for you to say that you are choosing him. He needs to choose you after you have been through the fire. He doesn't want people that will come into his house and bring a lot of scrap metal with them. He only wants the ones that are pure gold. And he can say that because he made everything for his pleasure. They are and were created. So I cannot question. The Bible says the clay does not question the potter. What are you making of me? Because I am an avatar. I was made for his pleasure. I do not have a say in the matter. And that is the reason why the new age gospel is what? The new age message is that you are the God. You just need to manage your energies and you'll be fine. Everyone is a God and a goddess. They'll be like, oh, I'm a goddess. If you're a goddess, why do you need to burn all that incense to feel good? You should just say, I'm a goddess, I'm good. No, you're not. You still need to burn all of that. When the Bible says that thou shalt not burn an incense that you do not know. That was a question somebody asked me. He was John. John asked me. John said, one of my neighbors asked me if I wanted to burn some incense. And I was like thinking of a scripture. He said, because I just knew that I shouldn't. He said, but I didn't know how. So he called me. He was like, there's a dude over the fence telling me about incenses. And I said to him, I said, do you know that incense? 
He says, I don't. I said, ask him if he knows the incense. He was like, no, I just went to one store and I bought it because it was recommended. I said, the Bible says you shall not burn an incense that you do not know. Let me tell you something. To know an incense is not just to know the chemical compositions of the incense, but to know the spirits that answer when that incense has been burned. Because every time you burn an incense, certain spirits will answer. Do you know that the presence of God in the Old Testament was evoked by incenses? When they burn certain incenses, the presence of the Lord begins to intensify because there are angels that carry the throne of God and they know how to answer to certain incenses. If you do not know, please do not burn it. Let me say that again because some people didn't get it. Go and read 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Hezekiah was so much, God was so fascinated by Hezekiah that he skipped his father and his grandfather and connected him. I think David was like his great grandfather. And God says, this Hezekiah is a son of David because he does what is pleasing to me. And what did Hezekiah do to please God? Hezekiah was able to reenact the composition of the incense for the house of the Lord. And he arranged for them to bring in the incense in full measure. Because the incense is had to be in full measure so that there is no room for foul wind to come into the censer. And the people could not burn full bottle incense because there was rubble on the way. And the Bible says Ezekiah put his life on the line and he says all the rubble must be taken away so that the incense can be full and it can be burned unto the Lord. When they did that, the presence of the Lord showed up big time. And so if God would show up when incense is burned right, Imagine who shows up when it's not burned right. So, the new age is telling us that we are the gods. They said that man is God. And that is why they said, let thy will be done. But nothing could be further away from the truth. It is nothing but a lie from the pit of hell. You are not God. God is God and he alone is. You are his avatar. If you are not led by him, you are led by Satan. There is nobody in this world that is just an empty vessel. It is either you're filled with the Holy Spirit or you're filled with something else. But we just read it. The Bible says man was not made to choose his own way. And that is the reason why God is committed to you. We read Psalms 107. Verse 17. Let's read it again because that was our scripture that we started reading. Excuse me, before the Holy Spirit told me to dial it back, I was immediately going to start to tell you how to climb the mountain of God. And this is what it says. 117, Psalms 107, verse 7. The Bible says, And he, which is God, led them forth by the right way, that they may go to a city for a dwelling place. Let me explain something here very quickly. Because even when John was speaking, you heard John saying, oh, when I get to heaven, I don't want that friend to say, it's because we grew up thinking that when, we, when, we, when Jesus comes, he will just take all of us and go to heaven. But what is really going to happen is what the Bible says, that when Jesus comes, he will establish his government upon the earth. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4, thrones shall be erect for the saints that will rule along with him for a thousand years while Satan is bound and after the thousand years, Satan will be released to tempt the, world, the nations once again. So God is saying, I've already selected my remnants and they will reign with my son for a thousand years where there is no Satan. But after a thousand years, Satan will be released to test the nations again. And only the ones that come out of that experience unstained by Satan will make it into the new Jerusalem. This is the new Jerusalem. God says, I'm going to guide you by the right way that you may end up in that city of dwelling. Because the Bible says this earth will pass away, heaven will pass away, and there will be a new Jerusalem that is called the bride of the Son of God, and its maker and builder is God. But you will be the pillars of that great city. Which means you're not going anywhere. Once you get into that city, God says, that's it. That is your eternity. You will be there with Christ Jesus, who will be the light in the midst of her. 
So this is God already telling you that my intention is to take you from Eden to the new Jerusalem. I am ready to lead you every step of the way. I came in human form to model to you an example of what it means to do the will of the Father. To say no to the pleasures of the flesh. And so when you receive that understanding, guess what? You should settle for no incentive for doing the things that you do other than the word of God. The only way to climb the mountain of God is to hear the voice of God every step of the way. Because if you have been led without hearing the step of God every step of the way, you may fall into the trap of Satan. Because Satan will come at a time of need and it will offer you an alternative to what God is trying to do in you. He did that to the Lord Jesus. You have to listen to this message again because I'm saying a lot of things and I'm saying it quickly because I'm being mindful of time. But I want to say this, when Jesus was tempted by Satan, what did Satan say to him? The first thing, he says, turn these stones into bread. Now Matthew, if you're hungry and you have the power, why not? And you know that the fast was over because it was for 40 days and 40 nights. You know, Jesus knew that the fast was already over. How does he know? Because when God was sending Jesus to the earth, he already said through his prophets that Jesus will be a prophet as unto Moses. And until Jesus came, the only person that had really fasted 40 days and 40 nights without food and water was Moses. It is humanly impossible for you to go for 40 days without food and water. But the Bible says God told Moses to come upon the mountain and that he will be without food and water for 40 days. And that was the reason why he was able to do it because there was a word of God that came forth to that regard. So Jesus knew that it was 40 days and 40 nights and the fast was over. So it was okay for him to eat. But when Satan was talking to him and said to him, turn these stones into bread, Jesus stepped out of time into eternity. He looked at the father and he was like, have you turned stone into bread? The father said, no. He said, okay. Have you said to turn stone into bread? The father said, no. He said, got you. So he came back to Satan and answered Satan. He says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Do you know when God said that? Jesus said, it is written. Where was it written? In Deuteronomy. After the people ate manna from heaven and they were filled with pleasures, God said that, uh, 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 don't get used to it. This is not the sustenance of your life. It is not bread that sustains you. It is my word. Because he knew that when they saw the bread, they thought they would always live by the bread. So Jesus was going back in time to revive an instruction that God had given. Because he knew there was no action without God's inspiration. If you act on your own, you are no longer his avatar. You become Satan's avatar. Let me tell you, Satan's most desired goal in life. Let me tell you what it is. You know, Satan... He saw into the future. He saw the reward of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me tell you something about Satan that I've already said before. You know, John chapter 1, the Bible says, In him, Jesus Christ, was life. And that life was the light of men. And the word of God became flesh and dwelt amongst men. And we beheld his glory. And it was the glory of the Son of God. So Jesus was the word of God. He became flesh. And in that instance, we see the life of God become the light of men. So Jesus brought us himself. He brought us the light. What is the meaning of Lucifer? Lucifer means the light bringer or the light bearer. So when Satan left heaven originally, his assignment was to bring light to the sons of men. But he saw the end result of fulfilling his assignment and it got into his head. Because when you look at what happened to Jesus after Jesus was raised from the dead, after enduring the death of the cross, somebody wanted to touch him. He says, not yet. He said, because I go to the Father. I need to first of all go to the Father. And what happened to Jesus was that he was raised from the dead and he went up and he was asked by the father to come and sit at his right hand until God the father makes all his enemies his footstool. Follow that trend and look at what the prophet of God said about Lucifer. He said, is this not Lucifer, the anointed cherub? The one who has said in his heart, I will arise like Jesus arose. I will go up like Jesus went up. He said, I will make my throne next to the almighty. He wanted to do everything that Jesus did. But he didn't do what Jesus did. Jesus obeyed the Father even to the death of the cross. 
many of us, we want the reward that God gives, but we want not, nothing to do with the obedience to his word. Jesus did every word that proceeded from the mouth of the Father. That was where Satan dropped the ball. But he still wants it. But that is not his ultimate goal. His ultimate goal is not just to sit next to the Father. You know when we were in Sunday school, they told us that Satan wanted to make his throne above God. You won't find that in the Bible. What he said in the word was, what is written in the Bible is he wants to make his throne next to God. He wants to be Jesus. He wants to sit at the right hand of the Father. But what is his loftiest goal is the most dangerous one. He says, and unto me, the congregation of the people will come. What Satan wants more than anything else in the world is for us to go to him. The way we call on the name of Jesus. Envy is killing that dude on the daily basis. The way our hearts long for Jesus. The way we are getting ready to call on his name on that great day of the Lord. Satan wishes. And that was why when Jesus was going, he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all unto me because unto the Lord shall the gathering of his people be. Hallelujah. Why is it the most dangerous thing? Satan wants worship. He wants everybody to come to him. And that is the reason why he's waiting for you to be out of step with God so that he can take you over. Let me tell you something. The moment you refuse to show love to your neighbor, you are acting on behalf of Satan. There is no middle ground. It's either you are in the light or you are in the darkness. In the realm of the spirit, there are no gray areas. And that is the reason why you cannot have a musician who claims to be born again, who is still glorifying the altar of Satan. If you claim to be born again, you're a musician of 20 years. You've already got accolades in the name of Satan. You don't just wake up one day and say, now I'm born again, but I'm still going to use all of the tools that Satan gave to me to continue to preach the gospel. No, God does not need all of those dirty associations that you have. You're supposed to renounce all of them. When the apostle Paul got born again, you know what he did? He first of all changed his name. He says, I'm no longer Saul. What is Saul? Saul means the one that is desirable, which means he's a celebrity. You know who are the desired ones today? The celebrity. Everybody wants to drive their cars. Everybody wants to look like them and wear their shoes. Don't look at mine. But then at the end of the day. Yeah, I know. That's what makes them celebrities, right? So when he got born again, he left his celebrity status. He changed his name to Paul, which means little. He humbled himself before the Lord. He said all the things that I've accomplished before now, he tore up all his certificates. When they arrested him in Rome, it was difficult for him to prove that he was a Roman citizen because he already tore his certificate. He said, but I will tell you, I'm a Roman citizen. I paid for it. You can look at your records because I no longer have the records. I tore everything. He said, everything that I attained up until the time that I met Jesus on the way to Damascus. He said, I have counted them now as dung. I put them before me and he started from the bottom again. But what do we see today? Celebrities just want to trans, they just want to change portfolio without changing their lives. No, it is the deception of Satan. No. Look at the people that got saved in the Bible who were celebrities. They left everything. Look at the rich young ruler. What was his problem? He wasn't ready to leave everything. Paul disappeared to Arabia for three years where nobody knew him. He was probably scrubbing floors. But celebrities today, they don't want to do that. I don't even know how I got into that, but somebody needed to hear that. Let's go back to what we were saying. You cannot serve God because of any incentive. Serving God begins with recognizing that it is a privilege and with recognizing that there is no other way than to seek Him. Because if you don't, Satan is ready to take you over. Look at Peter. When Peter spoke by the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell. A few verses down from there, he decided to say something that was out of step with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus looked at him and said, Satan, get thee behind me. From being a spokesman for the Holy Spirit, immediately he became a spokesman for Satan. The other day, somebody came to one of our meetings because I had done something that they liked. They were like, oh, pastor, we love you. And a few days later, they asked me to do something. And I said, no, that is not the will of my father. And then the next thing now, they hate me. And I'm like, in fact, let me tell you something. I, I kid you not. As soon as the lady says, oh, we love you so much, Pastor Moses. Oh, we love you. 
the Lord revealed to me what was in her heart. I just smiled. I was like, oh, thank you. And as she was walking away, my smile disappeared gradually because I knew that it wasn't genuine. She spoke that out of her emotions and also because she wanted to sell me on affection. You know, some people want to sell you in a particular way so that you feel good about them. But the Bible says Jesus, knowing what was in their hearts, did not commit himself to them. Do you know that some people don't come to church and they see how long it's going to take before I call them and I don't call them because the Holy Spirit revealed to me that they're only here because they want to be worshipped, not because they want to serve God. And the, somebody said to me, oh, you want your church to grow? You don't call people? I'm like, oh, it's not my church. I come here like you come here. You understand what I mean? Don't be fooled by the fact that I hold the microphone. It's a debt that I owe that I have to pay. Let me say this. I show up here to preach and teach because I owe a debt. When God gives you a gift, it is expected to be given away. If you hold on to it or you want to charge money for it, then you owe God more. So when you see me, John said the other day, he was like, Pastor, you were posting four videos a week during the lockdown. I said, yes. I said, because every day that I woke up, he was like I was in debt. Let me tell you something. The Bible says the wicked owes and does not pay back. So I come here like you come here because for me, this is an opportunity to pay the debt because the revelations have been freely given to me and the Bible says freely have you received, therefore freely give. And that is the reason why till Jesus come, God forbid that I charge money for this service of the kingdom because I am paying a debt, folks. <coughs> Jesus says if God gives you an opportunity to be a blessing to somebody, he says, do it as quietly and as secretly as possible. He said, because the moment they give you an accolade for it, he says, you have your reward. I don't want money to be my reward because I can't spend it in the world to come. I want an eternal reward. And that is the reason why I show up here. Because I am paying a debt. The rich young ruler, Jesus said to him, follow me. He said, but before you come, Go and sell all of what you have. Give it to the poor and then follow me. Jesus was doing him a favor. Jesus was like, come and follow me, but I don't want a debtor in my company. Pay all your debts before you come. The guy did not have the knowledge that all of what he had was not his. The Bible says there is nothing anyone has that he has not received from above. So all the wealth that he had belonged to God. And God was saying, okay, you have been a custodian of these assets. Now I've got a new assignment for you. Go and pay all the debt that you owe by giving it to the poor. He couldn't follow Jesus because he wasn't ready. And that is the reason why, by the grace of God, I will continue to show up here. So when that person said to me, oh, yeah, you want your church to grow and you don't call people? No, it is not my church. It is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't like church business. There are so many other businesses out there that God has gifted me for that is easier than showing up here and being judged and crucified and being persecuted. Jesus says that I guarantee you that your persecution will be in the hands of your brothers and sisters. He said, because that was what they did to me, they will do the same to you. When he was hanging out with Zacchaeus and the other big boys in town, did anybody crucify him? Did anybody judge him? That was one of the few meetings that Jesus attended without anybody trying to kill him. But the moment he's with his brethren, then it becomes an issue. So I tell you what, we need to get it straight. Some people are doing those things and we pray that God will continue to reveal their hearts to us so that we don't commit ourselves to them. I'm going to land this plane on this note. Come with me to Jeremiah chapter 9. You know that we read Matthew chapter 9 verse 19 and I, Matthew chapter 19 and I told you to go and meditate on all of Matthew 19 and one of the things that we got from it was that whatsoever we ask of God we need to make sure that we're asking it without any desire for a personal carnal incentive. Do it always as unto the Lord. So Jeremiah chapter 9 we're going to read verse 19 and look at what it says. For the voice of wailing is heard from Zion. How we are plundered. We are greatly ashamed because we have forsaken the land. Because we have been cast out of our dwellings. Let me tell you something folks. Psalms 107 verse 7. What does the Lord say? He says I'm leading you in the right way that you may inherit your dwelling. 
The reason why these people are cast out of their dwelling is because God recognized that they had put their trust and confidence in the things in the land where they dwelled. Look at the Bible says, this is Zion. Zion is meant to be uh, on the earth. The way the Lord showed this to me, you see that place that is called Zion on the earth. Everything about Zion is a description of the heart of man. God dwells in Zion, in the holy hills of Zion. He wants to dwell in our hearts. And so when you look at these people, the voice of Zion was, the, the people were wailing in Zion because they have been greatly plundered and they became ashamed. Let me explain to you the shame that comes from being plundered. If you are plundered, it means what you have has been taken. If what you have is taken and you feel ashamed, then that means the glory of God is not your covering. I'm going to explain that very quickly. Adam, when God came to Adam, what did he say? He was hiding. And God was like, why are you hiding? He said, because I'm naked. And God was like, who told you you were naked? Because God left his glory upon Adam. Who told you you're naked? Your gl my glory is on you. But the reason why Adam had gone to gather figs to cover himself was because his heart had ejected itself from under the glory of God and he put his confidence in the knowledge of the fruit, in the knowledge of good and evil. The moment something else becomes your confidence, the moment something else becomes your pleasure, outside of the hunger and thirst for the righteousness of God's kingdom, you are signing up for shame by nakedness because anything else outside of God can be taken away from you. So these people in Zion, they were wailing because of the fact that the things that they had had been taken away from them. So they were standing there covered in fig trees, ashamed just as Adam was. And God was like, this is the reason why I said, let me lead you. Because if I lead you, no one will take away your dwelling. He says, you will inherit your dwelling if I lead you. The summary of these folks is that in your quest for the righteousness of the kingdom of God, in this journey of walking with the Lord, let your heart 104% pay attention always to what God is saying. He will lead you every step of the way. The only times you don't hear God is when you're not listening to him. The only time you don't hear God is when you have allowed some other objects to be in your heart. When God speaks and there are other objects in your heart, every object scientifically has a sound that he makes. You see this chair that is right here? If I can connect a sonograph to this chair, this chair as it's sitting here is making a sound. You know why? Because everything has vibrations. Energies make sounds. And so that's why God does not want objects in your heart, idols. He doesn't want them in your heart because they will distort the signal of what God is saying. And that is the reason why I tell you what, nothing is worth your love outside of the word of God. So when God takes you to a place wherein you feel like you're not enjoying doing the things that God has commanded, be glad and be exceedingly filled with joy. For the word of God says, have glory in tribulation. Rejoice in tribulation because when God is the one taking those things from you, he's allowing you the privilege of recognizing that you do not need anything but him. And so if I don't have the comfort or the joy or the pleasure, but I have God, then I have everything that I need. I just need to keep going. I'm going to pray for you today from Matthew chapter 27. But it's a very dangerous prayer because it's a prayer that will set you at liberty and put certain weapons into your hands. It is now up to you what you do with it. Come with me to Matthew chapter 27 verse 3. I like to give a warning because it's like when you hand somebody a firearm, you tell them to put it in safety. You show them how to use it because you don't want to be the ones responsible for their demise, even though all you were trying to do was be kind. You know, the Bible says that the word of God is a double-edged sword. A double-edged sword requires special skill because either way it cuts, so as well as it cuts the enemy, it can cut the one that is wielding it as well. But you know, the church has become very psychedelic. Everything is all fun and games, all good music, smoke on the stage, and we just go home and go to have coffee afterwards. Let me tell you something. The Bible says no one that is at war entangles himself in the affairs of this world. We're a soldier. My mission and only mission at times, to be honest, I tell you, is to prepare the way of the Lord. And how do you prepare the way of the Lord? Let me tell you this, and I'm going to close. Emmanuel, thank you. 
you know that Jesus is coming back. How many people know that? Jesus is coming back. How is he coming back? <laughs> He's coming back <laughs> for war. When he's coming, the Bible says it will come with thousands and tens of thousands of his saints and innumerable angels and they will be riding on horses into battle. So when Jesus is coming, he's coming to restore all things. And when you look at the miscreants in this world that are running the show and the unholy pandemonium that they have caused, do you think Jesus is coming to pat them on the back for enslaving his people? No. No. What did Jesus say? He warned us. He says, no man takes that which is in the custody of a strong man without first of all binding the strong man. The strong man is the God of this world. His name is Lucifer. He's not going to let Jesus come and redeem you and I, even though we have been fully paid for, because he's a rogue and he's that thief that kills, steals and destroys. If he can't have it, he wants to destroy it. And if he can't destroy it, he wants to kill it. And that is the reason why Jesus is going to come swiftly with such a precision to do battle against the enemy. And so if you are preparing the way of the Lord, then what are you doing? You're preparing the people for battle. And that is the reason why sometimes I forget to smile for all of the 90 minutes that I am teaching because what my instruction is, prepare my people for war. It is a very difficult assignment, but I'm thankful to God because it is not popular anymore what I do and the kind of messages that I preach because people want 15 minute messages and coffee waiting for them outside the door with everybody smiling and looking pretty. We are soldiers. We are not called to be beauty pageants. Amen. Psalms 23. Sorry, Matthew 27, verse 3. The Bible says, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priest and the elders saying that I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. The reason why I said it's a dangerous prayer is that we are bombarded with messages of grace in the body of Christ today where people are constantly told, oh, we're sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Oh, you can never do wrong. Once saved, forever saved. You do not knock yourself out. As long as you profess Jesus, you can go and serve again under sin. And that is the reason why it is difficult for many people to comprehend what this verse of scripture is saying. The Bible says that Judas, when he recognized that he had been condemned, people would tell you, in 2022 or 2023 that there is therefore now no condemnation. Oh, you're born again. There's no condemnation. But that's not what the Bible says. The next time they say that foolishness around you, tell them to quote the actual scripture. Romans chapter 8. What does it say? It says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, not those who are in sin. Because if you are in sin and you're doing the things that your flesh is suggesting to you, the Bible says he that walks according to the flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But the ones who walk according to the spirit, eternal life and peace. Condemnation is not for you when you are in Christ, not when you are in sin. And so this is what Judah said. He said the moment he recognized that he had been condemned, he wanted to give back the money, but the world wouldn't take it. I'm encouraging you before condemnation comes, give back whatever the world has given to you. Whatever it is that is keeping you from following Jesus 104%, whatever is keeping you from seeking after the righteousness of the kingdom without looking for incentives, give it back to the world while you can. Because the moment the Son of Man appears in the blue sky and it touches the ground with his rod of iron, it is over. You can no longer return the pleasures of this world. So I pray for you today that in the mighty name of Jesus, and I want you to receive this prayer by faith in your heart, that you will not be found stuck with the pleasures of this world at the expense of the righteousness of the kingdom. 
that no matter what it is that you've engaged in, no matter what you have bargained on with the world, that you will find repentance and that you will drop whatever it is that is not of God like it's hot now before condemnation comes. Drop it now while you can because the time is coming wherein you can no longer return it. And so whatever incentives that your heart seeks, many of us will seek incentives to come before the Lord. God is leading me to go to that ministry, but I don't like their music, so I'm not going. They need to give me better music. That's my incentive. God is telling me to go and preach to that person, but I don't like the road to their house. If they paved that road better, I will go. That's an incentive. I want to forgive this person, but they haven't begged for my forgiveness. So I'm not going to forgiveness, forgive them because I'm looking for an incentive. Every such incentive that we are seeking after to do the will of God, let us dethrone them right now. Let us let go of them and do whatever the Lord has said to do. I pray for you that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will let go in repentance of every filth, of every guile, of unforgiveness, of the pride of life, of the lust of the flesh, of the lust of the eyes, that you will let go of the lust for mammon. Let go of all of those things because they are fleeting pleasures. And from this moment onwards, your heart will begin to respond wherever the Lord leads. For only those who are led by the Spirit of God are called the sons of God. So if you want to be in his army, and be effective as a child of God, holy as your heavenly father is holy, you can no longer chase what the world is chasing. If you want to be that person, you need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. I'm going to read one more scripture and then we're going to break bread with that. Hallelujah. Do you know that on Tuesday, can we just say amen to that prayer as many people as want to receive that? Praise the Lord. On Tuesday, um, do we all have the communion? Okay, it's on the way. On Tuesday, you know I kept saying I have one more scripture, I have one more scripture. How many people remember that I kept saying one more scripture? My mom called me and she was, no, she actually left me a voice message and she analyzed the various prophetic utterances that came after every one of those scriptures. And even myself, I had to go listen again because I'm like, wow, I didn't even realize that. She said, I listened and it's like, every time you say, well, I want to read to you one more scripture, there's a prophetic utterance. So I want to encourage you, if you did not receive the utterances and the things that I said after every scripture, thank you, Alan, that I quoted, I want you to go over it again because essentially what the Lord is doing is the Lord is empowering and equipping us with instructions for the days ahead, the days to come. You know, I am not one of those people who prophesy because somebody's paying them or who prophesy because it feels good or it brings people to church because the Lord says, look at them, they will speak and they will not come to pass because the Lord is not with them, neither has he sent them. I only say that which I hear because I know that a false witness is an abomination. I say that because I want your heart to not miss a thing that the Lord is doing in this house. So please go and listen to it again so that you will not say like the rich man, Oh, Father Abraham, oh, can you drop me, uh, 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 can you send Lazarus to drop me some water? When right now you're swimming in the abundance of revelation. Okay, I'm going to save you this one. Because <clears throat> if we get into this, we won't get out of here easy. But we may continue from there on Tuesday. I want you to stand up if you can and just hold up the bread and the wine in your hands. Hey. How many people remembered what the Lord said to us a couple of months ago when he said to us, if they don't come, don't beg them. He says, if they don't come, don't go after them. He said, because they are the ones that have been given an opportunity to recognize where the Lord has put his name, but they have decided to choose disobedience. They will have what is coming to them. We love them, right? But we also have to obey the Lord. For the word of God came to us very expressly. He says, there is a time for everything. There is a time to embrace and there is a time to refrain from embrace. Now, there is an update on that word. The Lord says that those people who were once amongst us, who have chosen to run after the pleasures of this world, who have chosen to allow themselves to be agents of Satan, to persecute their brothers and sisters. He says, now they have run out of oil. They will come looking for you 
says, do not give them your oil. Like the wise virgins, they said to the foolish virgins, they said to them, go and buy your own. Because if we give to you, it will no longer be enough for us. Neither will it be enough for you. Now, let me say this, and I want to say it very clearly. Every one of you, are you listening to me? They had their moments. Some of them are very dear friends of ours. Some of them once pretended to be comrades. In fact, some of them were indeed comrades that fell by the wayside simply because they were looking for things that the Lord was not doing. You know, certain people came and they wanted to see certain things, but because we did not dance to their tune, neither did we move in the direction of the cares of this world. They deserted us. We wanted to go after them and the Lord says, no, leave them, let them be. But the Lord is saying that the foolish virgins are coming looking for oil. By the grace of God, you have the authority of heaven to say no. How is this going to happen? Some of them will come and tell you, oh, can you please pray for me? Unless the Lord speaks and you hear it, don't lose your oil to the disobedient ones. The Lord has not called you and I unto the ministry of sympathy. He has called us to the ministry of disobedience, of obedience. Don't let anybody appeal to your sympathy. The devil is sending people out to drain you of your oil. You do not want to be found without oil when they come. Now, someone is saying, no, but does that not mean when people ask for prayers, when people come and let me tell you something, was it not mean when those people said, we're not giving you oil? And Jesus says that is exactly what they did that made them wise. Jesus led us by example. The man that was born blind was standing, was on the side of the road and he was begging Jesus, oh, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. You and I would have immediately just healed him. But Jesus was showing us that we don't respond because of sympathy. Jesus asked him and says, what can I do for you? Many of us would have been offended. Many of us would have said, really, Jesus? Can't you see that I'm blind? You have to ask me that question. If you don't want to heal me, don't heal me. Just get out of here. And Jesus would have gone. Because the kingdom of God says, ask and you shall receive. Jesus wanted to establish the principle of the kingdom because he will be moved with compassion, but he will not respond out of sympathy. They are two different things. To sympathize with someone is for you to know clearly that God is not leading you to serve them, but because now you feel bad for them. Is it your feelings that are leading you or the Holy Spirit? You have been warned. Guard your oil very diligently. They had the same opportunity that you had, but they chose to be backbiters. They chose to be ungrateful. They chose to be carnal. That's what the Bible says, that in the last days, men will become lovers of pleasure, not lovers of God, not lovers of the kingdom. They become lovers of money. And what will they do? They will become ungrateful and unthankful. It is their call. They made it. So I want to encourage you. Stand your ground, guard your oil because the bridegroom is only around the corner. So as we break bread today, now thank you Jesus, the Holy Spirit has given me the liberty to read to you Matthew 19, 23. And I want you to take it very seriously because the reason why I didn't read it at first was I, the Lord said to not read it and I had a feeling we weren't ready, but now we are. So look at what it says. Matthew 19, 23, and this is what we're using to break bread today. Alrighty. Matthew 18, 23. Look at what it says. Jesus said to him, I mean, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle account with his servants. When the bridegroom comes, he's coming to settle accounts. And you cannot tell him, oh, well, Jesus, you know, what you gave me, I gave it to um, Abigail when she came. Jesus will say to you, did I ask you to give it to Abigail? Or did I say for you to occupy until I come? The Lord is coming to settle an account, so we need to behave ourselves responsibly. Guard your oil. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. 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 Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you. Hey, sakum deshtale sum kalanderi alabosta. I see a mighty rain come from heaven and it looks like a flood. And as it came, it hit the ground and the splash pushed the saints into the air. 
the Lord is saying that this judgment that is coming is to elevate you. And so there is, the, see, the same thing that is falling upon the earth is what is going to lift you above the ground. You need to posture yourself in righteousness. Righteousness is that plate that would allow for your body in the spirit to be lifted. Ah, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what do we do with this? He said, I have given you the code to peace in the days to come. Your peace will be a function of your righteousness. And that righteousness is who you have become by being led by the Holy Spirit. Let your discernment be sharp. Let your obedience be complete. And let your feet be light under the instruction of God. When he says, go, you go. This is not a season to argue with the Holy Spirit or debate the instruction of God. It is the season to hear it and to do it. So that you will rise from that which has come to judge the works of unrighteousness. Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus that was broken for us and for the blood that was shed. As we receive this bread today, we receive it as the body of Jesus and we receive the wine as his blood. As we do so, we drink unto revelation, we drink unto insight, we drink unto peace. May we do that which you say all the days of our lives. In Jesus' name, you may eat of the Lord's body and drink of his blood. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's be seated for one minute. We're going to be out of here in a jiffy. And um, I like it when we can be out of here before nine o'clock. Isn't that awesome? Oh, yes. So very quickly as we're seated, um, the offering instructions are going to be on the screen. You know what to do. Um, we honor the Lord with our substance. And so when you do it, do it with a heart of worship. Do it by the leading of the Holy Spirit, not grudgingly, nor of necessity. Because there is no need that we're saying to give an offering to what? We don't raise offerings like that here. We bring our offerings and our tithes to honor the Lord. So I want to encourage you, the Lord, how long have we been doing this? We've been doing this since 2018. And by the grace of God, the Lord continues to meet our needs. And so we're not giving out of necessity, but we are giving because God loves a cheerful giver. And so you see the instructions. On Tuesday, by the grace of God, my wife is going to tell us a little bit more about the women's conference that is coming, the retreat. Praise God. The women's retreat that is coming because it's this month of October, isn't it? Two weeks time. Alrighty. And so she's going to tell us more about it. Um, and then on Tuesday also, I want us to prepare our heart for something. Alrighty. We're moving camp. We are moving camp. Now, I'm not talking about a physical location just yet, but I'm talking about that in the realm of the spirit, I have been advised on a change that is coming to our spiritual training. So we're moving camp, we're moving to another camp. And the implication of that for you as a believer is that you need to ensure that all of what this other camp, this season is there to fulfill in your life is fulfilled so that you are not left in camp to repeat a class. Alrighty, how many people remember the word that God gave to us as I was closing on Tuesday about the fact that I was praying in tongues and I heard the angel of the Lord interpret what I was saying in English and what did he say to us? Does anybody remember? He said, many of us, we have been landing in new seasons of our lives on our faces and we take almost all of that season to recover and by the time we're finally able to get up another season has come and that is the reason why there's no maturity and there's no fruitfulness because we're scrambling to actually stand and the Lord is saying that he has released a grace upon us in this house to allow for us to stand in this season so that when the next comes we are ready to receive what that season brings let me say that again in another way, you know there were two visions. One of them was the tongues and the interpretation. The other one was a bar that was shown to me that was red, that was blue, red, and white. Blue stands for the relationship that God has with us, the love that he extends to us. Red stands for the blood of Jesus that cleanses us of sin. And then that rod started to spin like a fan. And then the red portion of the rod became like a pool. He says, many of your brethren are wallowing in that pool of forgiveness. They're continuing, continue, 
continually needing forgiveness because they wouldn't mature away from their sins. He says, no, I need you to leave the pool of blood and come and stand in righteousness. So this season that has been upon us has been very clear to us, right? It's been a season of mercy. We've been asking for the mercy of God. It's been a season of resilience, knowing that we are not looking for incentives to do the will of God. We just obey what he says. And a season of advancing to the gates of Judah that we may stand at the gates awaiting our next instruction. Very clear this season. If you've missed any part of the message, just go back and listen to it. But God wants you to stand at the end of this season so when the next season comes, you are able to mount upon your high places. Let me tell you something. The Lord said something to me as I was preparing to come out today. You know, on Tuesday, I told you that I went to the Lord and the Lord said to me, it's on me to come with more parables so that people don't miss a thing of what I am pouring out. But one more thing that he said to me as I was coming here is that some people themselves have not taken the time to bring themselves up to date with the prophetic utterance that's been coming forth. All these things are available on YouTube. We do not charge any money for it. So avail yourself the opportunity of going back and listening so that you're fully equipped. I don't want you falling behind in this next season. All righty? Praise the Lord. God is good. Let us rise up and close out the service. I'm going to say a word of blessing over the offering. If you were busy listening and didn't give an offering, this is the time to do it. I'm just going to do mine also very quickly. And I just want to appreciate you all for your obedience and for your generosity toward God and the work that has been done in this house. Praise the Lord. Now, we haven't said this in a while, but I'm going to say it today. We appreciate you all, especially if you've been covering the transaction fees. So there's always a checkbox there that says cover the fees. I encourage you to do that. Also, it helps the house and it helps for your total sum to make it in the way you proposed in your heart. All righty, God is good. So that is done. And Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come around your presence, to learn at your feet, to hear what you're saying unto the churches. I want every one of you to just say, Father, thank you. Because I'm not following after the teachers who say the things that I want to hear. But I am humble enough to receive your word as it comes. Because it is able to save my soul. Thank you, Father, for Communion House. Thank you for the prophetic gift amongst us. Thank you for the revelations. And thank you for the ministry of your angels. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord. Alrighty, thank you all for coming. And I will see you on Tuesday, God willing. God bless you.